the there we go it says we are live oh jolly good hello each wow these weeks certainly zip by it's in really fact good. tuesday is the only day of the week when i really know what day it is because <laughs> my stylist here slaps stuff on my face and I get out of my jammies and into my daytime clothes. And, That's, hey. That reminds me, I have to get to the Home Depot for a new bucket of spackle. <laughs> Thank you very much. Elder abuse. Yeah. yeah, I was one of the few people that complained about wearing masks because I look much better in a mask. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, never mind all this nonsense. Let's get to the point. We have a very exciting guest today. A very old friend from the good old bad old days. He's not days. that old. Oh no, he is. I am. He's I was younger old than me. Only, yeah, he, 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 I had a birthday March 11th, so happy birthday! That's right. Yes. So uh, no, well, I'm 93, so I'm older than almost older than God, and, and a little younger than your teeth. Right? A little bit younger than my teeth. Anyway, on back to the plot. Back to the plot. Ruth, why don't you bring on our wonderful guest, Denny? Tedesco. Absolutely. And the crowd goes wild. Hello. Hi, Jenny. <laughs> hey. Oh, you don't look, look very much older. Well, a little, but not, not a lot. It, How, many How many years is it? How many years is it? So I met Ruth. Ruth and I were working. Ruth, you, I don't know what the video was. I still remember. I, it was a some hard rock know. video. And Ruth was there in her mink coat helping me wrap cable. I went, I need to know this woman. <laughs> I don't forget that. Mink coat, high heels, and workman's gloves, right? It, uh, it was amazing. What <laughs> for Paisley Productions? No, was no, it? it was no? amazing. No, it was 84, 85. Was it The Breakfast Club that band Madonna was no. producing? No. Oh, I don't. I just remember Tony Mitchell, I think, was shooting it. That's all I remember. It's God, so long. Right. The fact that I can remember anything, Ruth. David Lee Roth video? Nope. No. No. Yeah. I needed Quiet I Riot. Know. It was even a name Quiet, band. Quiet Riot? No, Could, I don't. I know. But Worked all I lot. remember is that was that was my introduction to uh, Ruth McCartney, and then she introduced me to you. And, uh, and it was and all then... downhill from there. Absolutely. Yeah. Do yeah. you remember yeah. when we all used to go to that? Um, what was it called? The place in Hollywood where they used to set fire to Firefly. the ball every night. Firefly. The Firefly. Wow. I lived, yeah. I lived across the street from the Firefly, and that was. Right. For the folks that don't know the story of the Firefly, who had been there for since the 30s or 40s, this bar at Hollywood and Vine. And it was right across the street. For, I lived in a little loft in uh, off the Broadway building. And I would go across the street. It was like being in Cheers, where they go, hey, hey, Danny, nah, 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 and you meet your friends there. And we'd drink and we'd have fun. And they yep. would take lighter fluid and put it into the drink well from one end yeah. to the other and then light it from one side. <laughs> And we go, Whoof, and everybody goes, and, and yeah. finally, the fire department finally closed the place down a few years oh. later. Yeah. I think it burned to the ground eventually, didn't it? No, 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 <laughs> no, it should, it there are probably reasons that should have been burned to the ground for other reasons, <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, <laughs> it was just so convenient for and the crowd that we would get in there was crazy, a bunch of film kids, mm -hmm. but because of the proximity to Capitol Records, which is a segue into yeah. you know what we'll talk about. It's uh, it was Hollywood and Vine was just that was the place to be in the eighties, huh? What was I doing there, for God's sake? You uh, in the Scotch, valley? Scotch and Coke, usually. Oh, probably. <laughs> Scotch and Coke. I don't mean Coke. I mean Coca Cola. Coca Cola, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Versus the wow. Firefly, where they had the other kind. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. I yes. believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You bet. Anyway, it first of all, before we get into what you're doing now, which is fascinating, I wanted to talk about. The Wrecking Crew, because, you know, your father was just a legend in my lunchtime. Yeah. All the yeah. artists he worked with. And I saw a wonderful picture of him with Elvis. Oh, yeah. He worked on oh, an yeah. Elvis movie, didn't he? Yeah. And he worked, yeah, he worked with Elvis a lot. Well, he worked with Elvis in the movies all the time. You know, when they would come to L.A. to do the movies, he was always there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was, is it Charles, the movie Charles, is that right? So you hear him all over the place on one of those songs, you know, because it's all Mexican mm -hmm. stuff, Mexican yeah, music. Right. And then, yeah. um, but then he did the comeback special. And uh, right. it was with Hal Blaine and, and dad and uh, the other guitar players were uh, Mike Dacey and Al Casey, yeah. Don wow. Randy was the piano player. And oh. that was Steve Binder's project, which is- Oh, you know, really? Steve okay, Binder was the one that directed that. Yeah. Amazing guy. Yeah, yeah he's lovely. Yeah. He was the guy that introduced me to uh, Shay J in Santa Monica. The oh, really? Yeah. Oh, excuse me. Here comes. Oh, watch out, watch out. Here they come. 
I don't know, yeah. What is going on? Uh, relax, everybody, relax. <laughs> Who left the dogs out? Who left the dogs in, in it? Yeah, in it, as we say. Shut up! Who wow, left the that dogs was in? That was okay. Oh, but, uh, it was uh, little on. ADR, uh, little ADR dog sounds there. Uh, there we go. That was my yes, neighbor, my sister who lives next door. Took the dog. Um, Okay, cool. Um, no, when I first met Danny, of course, Tommy Tedesco, his his late wonderful father. Oh. Um, so he's he's all looking at this crazy British chick in high heels and a mink coat and you know wrapping four art cable, and I saw his name on the call sheet and I'm like, Tedesco, are you any relation to Tommy? And he's like, Yeah, that's my that's my dad. I'm like, Oh my god, he was in the Partridge Family. That's right. <laughs> Oh, yeah, because she used to read all the liner oh, notes. Oh, oh, I was David was Cassidy a, crazy. I was yeah. going to, I was, when I was 12, right. I was trying to save up enough stamps to mail myself to Columbia Pictures from England. I remember I was gonna, that. I had and, sandwiches. I had a plan. I was going to get water in a box. I was going to mail myself first class to David Cassidy. And then I met you, and your father was in the Partridge family. I just, I knew fell down. I so when you say in the Partridge family, what, what part did he play? He played guitar? guitar, a guitar, of course. Yeah. On all the records. Oh, I see. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's it's how funny I because that was the first time I got credibility with my friends at the time when I was a yeah. kid. I bet. Yeah, yeah. No one ever saw, you know, no, we didn't know what he did, you know, to that point. You know, <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. How's that for name dropping? Yeah. yeah. In fact, our, our friend Charlie Walsh from Florida, he's just saying Denny is an icon. Absolutely. Wow. He is, and and Charlie, I'll send you the check later. Yeah, yeah. and Charlie was um, among the very, very few people at the end of Louise Harrison's life who took care of her. I think he was among the last, of, visit her last regular, people to see, yeah. to see her down there. And um, so we, we're sort of, Charlie and us are tied through that whole Beatles family and then, you know, back around. Like we were saying, it's it, you know, it's such a small crew, and then you, you think about, the Wrecking Crew and all of the things they played on. Yeah. Um, the remarkable thing to me when I first watched your film was um, I didn't realize Glenn Campbell was a part of that, yeah. of course. Yes. Yeah. And and Carol Kay, I mean, a woman and a bass player in the oh, 60s. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah. yeah. And Leon Russell yeah. was part of that too. That's you know, right. In the early days, in the early, the whole thing about the Wrecking Crew was, you know, the whole name is kind of made up, but that's beside the point. But you know, in the early 60s, when these musicians were starting to get all the, um, what do you call it, uh, recognition from the producers, they needed people to play. A lot of it was non-union gigs at the beginning. You know, it was, hey, we got a demo, da, 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 and yeah. go to Gold Star, and they would take a chance on doing a demo, and then that demo became a, you know, legit hit. So all these guys were doing all this stuff for Spectre, Jan and Dean, Mamas and Papas, Fit Dimension, and then Sinatra, and all that early stuff um liam was part of it dad was part of it hal blaine was really the key drummer and then earl palmer as well was working a lot and mm -hmm. um it just took off and yeah. took off to where the point where they had to have these guys in the band or in, you know they didn't trust the road bands as everybody remembers because it was well, different in the days in the studio you didn't have you only had three hours to knock off yeah, i you know, know crazy three or four songs you know, that was it. You didn't have the band going, the road band could take forever, you know, going into knocking off a song. Yes. Um, right. So that's why these guys were in demand. And then sooner or later, the bands got better and more tracks came in. You, mm -hmm. know, you only had one track when they started. You know, so everybody in that band had to be nail it. That's why Carol's an amazing story because as a bass player, she's not somebody's girlfriend or somebody's, you know, she's not in an instrument that can hide. You know right. what I mean? You can yeah, maybe right. hide another saxophone among the saxophones or something, but right. she was leading with the drummer, you know, laying right. down that beat. Yeah. You, know, you don't have a good bass player and drummer, you're done. So that's why oh, Glenn right. Campbell said it was like playing with Michael Jordan in that room. He goes, everybody yeah. was Michael Jordan. Because if you yeah. slowed anything down, you had to start all over. You didn't just pop in, you know, at you know, right. bar 32. We right. just started all over, and we got three hours. We got to get out of here because we got another gig coming up. Yeah. So, and often they'd have to pack up, especially drummers, and drive across town, right? Go to another studio. Well, no, you know what? Hal was so busy at that point. What he had is he had this guy named, uh, oh, God. Oh, I lost his name. Uh, Rick. Rick would basically set up the drums. He had multiple sets of drums. 
So Vic uh-huh. would basically set it up as say as gold star. Then Hal would come in and maybe go to Capital. He already had another set set up there. So in a sense, he was the first cartridge for Hal. He was doing cartridge for Hal and then started doing it for the other drummers. And it got to the point where the Teamsters were actually coming down on Hal because, you know, it was like they were threatening him. It was like, uh uh-uh. And they let it go. Um, You know, and Rick would just do that. That was the only way to do it. Drummer could only do that. Yeah, yeah I mean, my father would take his guitar. My father had his guitars in, in the car. You know, yeah, he had yeah. his yeah. his tools, as I say, people assume, you know, my dad's tools of the trade were, you know, let's say a gut string, uh, you know, the classical electric, a telecaster, maybe, you know, a jazz guitar, a 12 string and a mandolin and a banjo with an amp. And, yeah. you know, oh, that's what goodness. he would go to work with. It just, yeah. you know, every, you know the, the funny thing is, Ruth, you'll appreciate this. You know, all these guitar players are always freaked out about their guitars being in the car. He never yeah. took his guitars out of the car. So the because really? he was, because he was gone for 12 hours a day. So he's going doom, 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 doom. So he's locked up. So he goes back to work in the morning. He's just right. going around. So it's not he wasn't worried about they were always being played. So other than getting stolen, that was another thing, but the heat didn't bother him. Wow. Um Charlie's from Florida's got a, a question. Um, he's a follower of Brian uh, Wilson, and he's, he's they're kind of friends. Um, what what are your thoughts, Danny, on Brian's influence with the Wrecking Crew? I mean, it's interesting because every one of these guys. Um, I wish my father had been around when I started this. Well, he was around when we started the project, but not he never saw it done. But when I went to like Glenn and and Don Randy and Leon. They all talk about Brian as is just being a genius. I mean, he really is a genius. And what I think is what's lost was lost for my father. Right. Was my father would have gone in, done his thing, dun 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 dun, and move on. He didn't really ever listen to the mixes and none of that. Oh, I think man. these other guys really got to hear and listen and pay attention because right. what Brian was doing in the studio with my dad's there is maybe not so, you know, interesting. But right. when he put it together, I think that's when the real genius was coming out. Right. You know? I know when, when Pet Sounds came out, um, it freaked John Lennon and Paul out. They were like, oh, yeah. boy, you know, we, we better step up our game. And then, you know, hello, Sergeant Pepper. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, but, I, I mean, it's, he and like uh, Leon said, Russell said he would go around to all the guys and say, here's the party. He would sing it to the guy. Next one all the way around. And he'd know everything. By the time he got around the whole room, the first guy probably forgot it. But, you know, Brian knew exactly what he was doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Brian was the only guy in the studios, by the way. You know, none of the other guys were there. Except for uh, Carl was there doing it. But Carl would do it, I think, away from the guys. His solos wasn't only, they were, it sounded like he would do it on his own later. Wow. Amazing, because you you know when you, when you're a fan and you pick up the record and you listen to it, you sort of visually imagine. Or I did in those days, everybody gather around a microphone in a studio doing it, you know, all mm-hmm. together. Yeah. Crazy. Well, well, the singers did. You know, yeah. that's the thing. The singers, but that's it. Uh, wow. So the guys, my father never really remembered meeting the Beach Boys, other than huh. Brian. Wow, mm-hmm. that's one of my favorite vibes in studio vibes in town is. Um, Studio three at East West, the pet staff, yeah. the pet staff room. It's tiny, yes. but mm. it's got something about it. And when you walk out along to the, you know, to the parking lot to, the, to go out the back, yeah, um, not sunset, but you know, the sideway to the parking. Yeah, I swear to God, sometimes I can smell. I know that nobody's smoking anymore in the studio, but right by that wooden back door, I can smell cigarettes. Yeah, this, before you get out, and it's like, yeah, did I mean, they? That- was this the Siggy corner where they all used to hang out and smoke? Probably. Because they, 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 they didn't have to have a corner, Ruth. In those days, they didn't have any corners. They didn't need to. They smoked right. right there. Yeah, that's right. right. My, mother, my mother, my father had a horrible reputation of being a smoker. He didn't do yeah. drugs. He didn't drink. But you knew where Tommy was on the last session because there was a pack of cigarettes on the ground. You know, literally <laughs> like butts. And wow. he never... He never had a cigarette. Not if you look at that film, I don't think there's a picture without a cigarette in his hand. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. My dad, my dad, Jim McCartney was the same. He used to, he could easily go through a carton 
of, of Peter Stuyvesant, Stuyvesant yeah. every day because he would light one yeah. cigarette from the other and then he'd have one burning in every room just in case he forgot to take one with him. Yeah, you know? it's, it's, it's such a sick, uh, you know, That's it's weird. weird. Well, I mean, you don't think about it because I smoked, so you don't think about it until years later. Yeah, no, I, I never did, and I never got into the whole drug thing. I, you know, I'll have a, yeah. a refreshing adult beverage once in a while, but... It's, uh, we were actually, you know, when 1972, I would have been 12 and that was really kind of at the height, you know, the Beatles had broken up and wings were starting and there were just a lot of people through the house. We'd ding dong, the doorbell would go and it'd be, you know, rock star XYZ, Dusty, Dusty Springfield and Madeline Bell or, um, you mm. you name Rod Stewart. Uh, Mike yeah. said I could stay in the guest room, you know, and so they would bring various and nefarious characters and types with them back from the pub. And, you know, lots and lots of drugs going, being hidden from me as a child in and out. But this one was so smart. She said to me, well, um, you're getting grown up now. So make a list of whatever drugs you want to try. And me and your dad will sit at the kitchen table and we'll all do them together. And I went, ew, ew. not cool. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Just never got into it. Mm. Kind of wow. smart. Reverse yeah. psychology, it was called. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, how long did big... it? Actually, how long did it actually, from start to finish, in case we have any budding filmmakers out here, um, to get the Wrecking Crew done? Do you want to scare them? Is that what you want? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, so, Dad, Dad was passing away. I heard he was. Well, I heard. We got the notice. He, uh, Dad, was diagnosed with um, with terminal cancer, and he only had like eleven months. So that's ninety five. So in 96, we quickly, I wanted to tell that story about the guys in the band, the Wrecking Crew. So I yeah. put together Dad, Hal Blaine, Carol Kay, and uh, Plaz Johnson at a round table and started shooting that in 96. And then I started slowly bringing in uh, a couple other folks. And I got Don Randy and Nancy and then Cher, but Dad died at this point. And uh -huh. then I put together a, a, a piece and he dies in 97, so 98 I get a nice short you know piece to shop around and no one would help me um wow. they said you'll never get this made because there's too much music in it you'll never be able to tell the story <clears throat> and because it people assumed it was always going to be the labels and da, da, da. it wasn't it was economics you know it's only sure. going to make this much it's going to cost us this much right and i had to keep going because now it's like well if i just listen to them well i'm, I'm dead so i just yeah. kept going building 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 and over those years, I would build, I get Brian Wilson in there after eight years. And then I get uh, Herb Alpert and and Nancy Sinatra already had and Cher and Gary uh, Lewis. And I just kept building. And then after 10 years, my wife Susie thought we just made the most expensive home movie ever. Right. And we had nothing to show for it. And, and I realized, well, if I don't cut something, we're done. And that's when I basically... Um, Borrowed it again. Is. I was doing all this by people say, who helped you? I said, well, Wells Fargo, American Express, Citibank, you know, all those credit cards helped. Yeah. And then they, yeah. you know, they, they beat the, you know, so we made the film and yeah. 08 got into these festivals. 09, we got in festivals and we won a dozen awards, amazing reviews, yeah. sell out crowds everywhere. Um, but we still owed, you know, over half a million dollars worth of licensing between the music and the photos right. and everything so right. i had to keep going and then finally i figured by 2010 how are we going to do this no one's touching us right. and i but i couldn't stop i crossed that line of no return yeah. if yeah. i don't go that means great i got a bunch of trophies of you know on the on the shelf next to my uh, most inspirational baseball trophy as a little leaguer you know nothing mvp <laughs> but Right. Um, and I just kept going and I thought, well, let's try to find sponsors. And basically what I did was I wanted to get the music community behind it, get Fender or Zildjian and, yeah. and none of these companies would help with money. That was the thing is I said, let's take the DVD. We'll have all the outtakes of the guitar players. You hit the button, you see a Fender commercial. Yeah. They, no, no, no. Okay, fine. So then I started getting people so I'm basically, hey, I'll dedicate a song. And I said, what do you mean? He says, I'll give you $1,000, this one guy said, to dedicate Up, Up, and Away. 
He said, that got me into radio. He said, when I was a kid, I had the transistor radio. I had up, up and away on two different stations. One wow. was a one low, this AM was lower than this AM. He goes, that's where he got into technology, this guy. He says, make it like a dedication, like a brick in the wall at a hospital or something. I said, okay. Yeah. And that took yeah. me on this road of figuring out ways of, you know, you give me a thousand dollars up, up away, you write your, your beautiful notice or your beautiful dedication out mm -hmm. uh, on the website and on the DVD. But on the end of the film, up, up and away is dedicated by Greg. Da, 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 da. And same thing with all the songs. Smart so idea. So look back yeah. on it, we'll see people's names dedicated by. That's what I wonder meant. where that came from. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. that started me then going to around the country. I would have, I was like barnstorming. Yeah, I would yeah. go to small towns. I would play in schools. I play in studios. I play in theaters. I play anywhere. I had a kind of help there where someone would be involved. I do it for charities. I get some. They get some. I take the money and I basically pay off a label, pay off a um, a wow. publisher, and I so kept it's going. Grassroots screenings, in other words, all it's over. It's really crazy. I mean, there was. I would put up on the screen before a movie star movie started pictures of the crew, some of the soundtrack are playing in the background and, you know, Hey, thank you uh, to our sponsor, the, you know, Mary's grooming, you know, uh -huh. blah, 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 dog grooming, wow. you know, they, they give them six tickets for a couple hundred bucks or whatever. Wow. And that's why I never paid for a hotel room for three years awesome. because I always gave tickets away to the show. Uh, and, yeah. and they were, you know, people were into it. If it wasn't for real people, Wow. That film would never have been made because I couldn't have done it. I, I ran out of money, obviously, right. once I right. you know, stopped. Wow. And that started me. I mean, the greatest at that point in 2013, 14, 15, the film had been done. I know the film was fine. I never questioned the film because real audience had seen it. It was just right. a matter of paying off the debt. Right. And when I was in the best marketing sale I ever had was. Everybody loves a clown. The Gary Lewis song. Yeah. I thought, Who's going to dedicate that to their loved one? You know, that sounds <laughs> well over well. So mm -hmm. I thought I'm going to find a clown school, and I called the L.A. Clown School, and I pitched him, and he goes, "Yeah, I'm in." I was like, "That was more exciting than making the film. The fact that I could pitch that and got a thousand dollars off these guys." That's and funny. Um, Elizabeth's asking, Mr. Tedesco, how does an unaward winning filmmaker find corporate sponsors? I wasn't, now, guys, I would, Elizabeth, I wasn't a uh, award winner, don't forget. Um, right. At that point, I'm still like working it. You just have to make those calls. The hardest thing is making those calls and see if right. you can get through back past the gatekeeper. Oh, you know, he yeah. said if the door was closed, find another way in, go through a window. Um, That's right. Mm -hmm. I, is, I learned one thing this, I was doing a project and this, uh, it was nothing to do. I was just producing it. It was a sales thing, guy that sells houses or whatever. He goes, you got to make 20 calls before, of 20 yet no's before you get a yes. Yeah. And there was an interesting concept. You know, I don't, I sound like I can preach it. Do I do it? No. Cause I get <laughs> disappointed just like everybody else, but <sighs> it's true. You need to just keep banging away. And sooner or later, you're going to get someone that's going to talk to you. Right. I think the hardest thing for all of us in, in trying to overcome it is the damn emails. And I think you need to actually get on the phone sometimes. Yeah. And when I start fearing, well, wait a minute, I'm the same guy that's hanging up on the person that calls my house. <laughs> so yeah. I, feel, yeah. I think that's why I panic. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. Rejection and so is now by email, don't you think? I, well, and silence is golden. I mean, we get a lot of crazy requests, as you can imagine, because we own the domain name and all the emails that go to McCartney.com. So oh, you wow. can only yeah. imagine the stuff we get asked for. Mm -hmm. um, and in the very beginning, you know, one of our kids here, one of our crew, Lucy or Caitlin or somebody would, would answer. My credo as a CEO was answer every single email. Everyone deserves yeah. an answer. But A, the volume and B, the craziness of some of these things, I, I just sometimes I hate to do it and it really rankles me, but I just delete just because if you engage with some somebody that's yeah. clearly kind of off the well, reservation. It, all right, so that's a really interesting thing. All right, so let's go back, though, on the other side. Susie, my wife, would say, do you have to answer everybody's email? See? I said, yes, because now obviously it's different if there's way too much and it's obviously a sales thing, whatever. 
you just don't know who's on the other end. And that had worked out many a times where I engage in someone just asking, I will always engage with someone's asking me a question about wrecking crew or whatever. If it doesn't oh, yeah. look like the sales car, I I'm all over it. I, you know, give them a, you know, say, yeah, look, check it out. Da, da, da. Um, but my dad, I learned that from my dad also. My, and you'll talk to any guitar player that came into town in the seventies and eighties and they'll say, Oh my God, I called so-and-so and no one returned my call. I called this person. This one. Your dad was the only one that called back. Ah. And, and ah. my dad, I think there was two reasons. One, he knew where he didn't know who this person was. He didn't know if it right. was a gig. He didn't know what. And he would talk to the kid and say, listen, you're noon time. Well, you know, come to a session with me. And nah. many of these amazing guitar players would see sessions with my father by just oh. calling. And he would say, meet me at the Universal Gate, da 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 be there on time. If he wasn't on time, forget it. He's, he's already in. And he would have the kid just sit next to him and watch wow. what was going down. Wow. Many of the great guitar players of today had that chance. Wow. And that was really amazing. Um, because that, that's that the is, thing I learned. I have well, to, that's so generous. You know, it's, well, I just, I think it, the, I think people need to be engaging. You have to engage in people. Yeah. You know, you need to talk to people. Right, which is why we love our crowd here on TFLIX Tuesdays. Every Tuesday, we find, you know, old friends, interesting people, whatever, and we have a conversation, which is why I use this software is because I can pop people onto the screen and we're, we're all kind of sitting in this virtual room. Um, yeah. you know, these podcasts that are just the host and me, me, enough about me, what do you think about me? Um, you know, not I'm not really interested in that kind of thing. But, no, we do get crazy stuff like um, – can I go in your limo to the Grammys? And then when Paul announces a tour, um, can we have six know, tickets I, I and need, backstage I need passes. six tickets, backstage passes, passes, and one of us is in a wheelchair. So where's the ADA ramp entrance to such and such a stadium? And just, like, and just say, okay, right, this, yeah, right what, it. And like I've got there's the six plan. tickets in your name. What's your name? Okay, there's six tickets there. Just go to the. Go to yeah. The next. No, but you see, that's why I, I, I agree with you. I'd love to engage with, with everybody, but some people just. I don't have that. I don't listen. I don't have that problem. They want the moon. You know? Yeah. You get a couple uh, knuckleheads, but you get a lot more knuckleheads than I'll ever get. Yeah. And they, they mean well and they're fans and they're sweet. And I'm sure they love the people, but, but I can't, I can't help them. So I just don't want to disappoint them. Yeah. So um, silence is golden in, in some ways. Sometimes. Yeah. So. How and when did you, and obviously Susie would have had to be a part of this big decision, when did you think, okay, I achieved that, it was 10, 15 years of my life, but I honored my dad and his friends with the Wrecking Crew. Um, when did you decide or were you approached because of the Wrecking Crew to work on this amazing, yeah. uh, well, I, thank you, Screena, the immediate a, a, Interesting transition. So once we basically raised all that money, you know, I was looking for a distributor, Magnolia, I went to Magnolia. Oh yeah. And what, I actually went to a couple places. One person who said, listen, you should go to a bigger vendor. He goes, I think, and he was very honest with me. He goes, listen, I don't think the majors even know you're done. They think you came and went in 2008, you ah. know, cause they don't know what I'm doing. So I went to uh, Magnolia and told them what I, you know, I finished paying everything off. They said, great. And they put it out. We were shell shocked at that point, you know. Uh -huh. um, we, I'm gonna be honest, we went bankrupt at that point. We lost, you know, we kept our house, but we went bankrupt. And because I was flipping cards, I always had. The funny thing is, I had good credit because, yeah, I was paying off the minimums, but right. that kept adding up, adding up. And I was looking to, you know, for the big win, looking for the big win, you know, throw that dice, and it's gonna pay everybody off. Even when I got the film released, it's not enough to pay the, everybody off. Wow. And so that was like, uh-oh. And it was the accountant said, you can't do this. You got to, you know. And it was a weird feeling. of, But it, it was only the credit cards. So I didn't knock anybody. You know, no one lost on my end. Yeah, right. Or, you know, vendors. So I felt good, okay about that. But it is a feeling of horrible feeling. Yeah. Going back. Sure. But it's sure. part of life. But and you, did it so, for, you did it for your dad, so. The hell with it. Did it well, did it for my, I had to go for my family. You know, right. I had to make sure I saved them. And mm -hmm. so no, I mean, the you, you did the, film, oh, the, the, film. The, the project, you did it with passion and love. And if, if the banks don't understand the money part, well, uh, they, don't care. That, 
That's the I, gave, hey, I gave the banks options of bringing that interest rate down. No one, you know, if they'd done asked, you know, when you ask a bank, can you bring it down from 12 to eight mm -hmm. or whatever? Mm -hmm. And well, they didn't do it. And I'm sorry, but no. I ended up doing is shell shocked. I kept doing, you know, working on other projects, you know, producing, you know, TV stuff, you know, like uh, promos and things like that. And then 2019 came around and these guys, Greg Grishling and Jonathan Sheldon and Jack Pye came to me, these directors, uh, producers, and they said, would you be interested in doing this project? It was on about the guys in the section. I went, oh, now that's way, that's like right up my alley. You know, the yeah. guys in the section were Dan, Danny Kochmar and Leland and Russ Cuckle, Leland wow. Scalar. And they have a band now currently called the Immediate Family, which is with Wadi Wachtel. I went, wow, this, you know, this makes sense. Yeah. Um, for because in the end of the Wrecking Crew, I asked Lou Adler, hey, I said, well, did you make a conscious decision to stop using those guys in the Wrecking right. Crew mm -hmm. when you did Tapestry? And he said, oh, he goes, no, no. He says, Carol brought in her own people. Right. She brought in James Taylor and Danny Kochmar. So it seemed like a natural trans transition from the old to the new. And when I said in the beginning of the Wrecking Crew, I said, this is the story about my father and his extended family, the Wrecking mm -hmm. Crew. Now, the fact that these guys have a band called Immediate Family, that's mm -hmm. what it is. All you musicians, yeah. when you're together for years, you are a family. Yeah. And, you know, some families break up, some don't. But these yeah. guys never were together. They were just in and out for years. But when he needed to put a band together, Danny thought, I'll put my brothers together. Right. You know, yeah. to do this album. And that's how it started. So that seemed like the natural, you know, sure. jump off. Well, um, you're the, you're the, you would be the perfect director for it, having lived through the not just the filming and the wrangling of the celebrities, but the storytelling of the Wrecking Crew. It's basically, yeah. basically right. these guys are Wrecking Crew 2.0, aren't they? Yeah, really? yeah. And, and, and it's interesting. Steve Pastel had a good, you know, who's in the band with them, said something at a screening recently. He said, Denny's the perfect person for this. He said, because he's not a musician, uh -huh. which is, yes. you know, which is interesting play. because yeah. I'm not, I can't, you know, right. Everybody no, you can, play. I can play, but I can't. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah but it's, and Steve Postel. I, wondered, Steve, oh, Steve I, Postel. Say, I understand the psychology of these guys. I understand, yeah, yeah, you know, he's very fortunate to be around one of the great players of our time and, you know, legendary in his studios and this and that. But I also saw, other players come and go. I saw my yep. father's career, you know, come to, a, you know, to an end in right. the 80s or 90s, actually. You know, yep. and I saw him, how he dealt with it. He was fine with it. But I know there's always something underneath. God, I'm oh, not yeah. it. Right. But even though you're not a musician, being Tommy Tedesco's son, it's, it's in your DNA. You can't help but understand music. It's in your blood. I mean, it's just, yeah. you know, the son, of, the son of a chef is probably going to be a great cook, right? So you okay. you understand that you you get the vibe and and you've seen all the ups and downs and the dramas. So you, you know what these guys have been through, not just as studio musicians, but also, you know, Family. I didn't realize, yeah, but road bands. Um, yeah. And so you, you go from the crazy of the road in the 3 a.m. bus and sharing a bathroom to all of a sudden you got to bang out X amount of tunes. You know, I mean, the way Leland Sklar goes and literally just learns everything and puts it in that computer that is hidden behind that beard in his head. Yeah. Is and, and Kunkel, too. But, you know, I think that you're right when you were talking about um, Carol Kay earlier. The foundation of any good band has to be. The rhythm section. I mean, we, we yeah. just did a gig recently um, with a great artist that we work with called Nick Marischal. And he always jokes I'd be an all-star band if he wasn't in it. He's hey. got he's got John Ferraro on drums. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he's got Travis Travis Colton, who's Larry Colton's kid, yeah. on bass. Yeah, bass. Um, and they just lock. And his previous bass player was Andrew Ford, who's been out on the road with um, Chaka Khan for years. But, you know, finding that magic combination of the bass player and the drummer, people often ask us about, you know, what was the magic of the Beatles? And to a certain extent, I, it's, it's just a posit, but Ringo and Paul are both left-handed. I didn't so, know what Ringo was. Oh yeah, he yeah, but he had to play when when they got you know a five pound gig somewhere. 
he didn't have a drum kit till Brian Epstein bought yeah, him right. once. He would show up to a right-handed kit. So he had to learn yeah. to play right-handed kits. Mm. But if yeah. you give Rico his druthers, he's he's left-handed and so is Paul. Mm. And so maybe that was the, the lock between them. Yeah. Um, and that's, again, the tragedy when somebody like Charlie Watts passes away. Mm. There are a million great drummers out there, but they're not Charlie Watts. They don't fit in that recipe, mm. yeah. right? Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, I just, yeah. So, well, these guys, I mean, with the other difference between these guys and my dad, when they came in, you know, when, oh, let me go back to when I started, when I met with these guys, Yeah. they said, well, I pitched them the idea, you know, and I only knew Leland personally, you know, because right. Leland was one of those guys that always showed up at all the Wrecking Crew things, which was like, dude, you're amazing. You know, he was always there supporting. He's a class and, act. Totally. And so when I met the guys, the other guys at first time meeting them, and pitched them the idea and they said, great. And then the next day we got that call from um, Carol King's office said, yeah, Carol can do it in three weeks. I went, uh oh, now I was not ready. It was like Carol King said yes to an interview. And I'm like going, oh shit, I don't know if I have that story. You know, I don't, you know, I'm pitched the idea, but now I go get it, it's real. I don't have 19 years this time to make the film. We have to make this, I'd speed up the progress. So I quickly jumped into it and within, Two months, we had Carol King, James Taylor, Jackson Brown, Linda Ronstead, Lou Adler, um, and a few more. I mean, just Phil Collins. It just kept going. Yeah. And that says so much about these guys because these people would do anything to jump and help tell their story. Yeah. That's um, great. Yeah. 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 I, would, I had forgotten um, what, what an integral part of all of that that our old friend Peter Asher was. But, you know, he oh came God. out. So, mm. so I don't know if you've done the math on this, but Peter Ash's sister Jane was engaged yeah. to, to Paul McCartney, yeah. which which is how he got involved in Apple and then signed James Taylor, and then the rest is history. So, mm. again, it, it's sort of it's it's all you, of that family. You take Peter, you take Peter out, music changes. Yeah, you don't have James, you don't you have don't Carol have and James. You don't. You might no. not have. You know, Linda. Carol Linda. might have gone with. You know what I mean? Because Carol's playing with James at that point, right? And then yeah. he, he he's doing Linda Ronstead as well, and right. Who knows? Carol Carol was very sort of brill building, like you say in the film. She, she was, was yeah. very yeah. establishment. Very we high. we worked with her her daughter Sherry Goffin Condor, who has an amazing music education for children. Oh, that's program. right. Sugar the beats, early days. yeah. Sugar beats like beats, mm -hmm. um, and so you know, obviously preparing to work with Sherry doing more research into her mom, into Carol, she was really just an established, you know, getting to be an established songwriter. And I don't think she ever really thought she was going to be an artist. But again, no, you take no, no. They had take for, they, they, Yeah, they forced her into, you know, the guys, I think right. it was James or, or uh, Danny, or they all said, go do a couple songs. Right. You know, and the war, you know, they, she would warm up, at, uh, you know, and she mm. would sing a song, but she was very shy. She didn't want to be that, Headliner. Oh, I love her. I think she's wonderful. Oh, Tapestry yeah. is like, you know, yeah. one of the Desert Island Discs. They used to have a, remember the the yeah. radio show? Yeah. 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 The BBC. Yeah. yeah. That's oh, right. If you're trapped on a desert island, what do you what do you take with you? Well, Tapestry would be on my list for sure. Yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, you take Peter Asher out of that equation. And I love the way in your film, in The Immediate Family, you sort of keep, he's sort of a, a, a pinning point, right? That's right. You know, you keep coming back to, to the thread. thing that is Peter. Yeah. And at the beginning, what really moved me was um, the tree. The fa It's like a family tree. Yeah. And all the yes. leaves have all the artist's names on, and then yeah. a song is featured and a little flower comes up on that leaf while yeah. you're listening to the song. And yeah. um, you, forget, you forget how connected we all are. Really, through yeah. music. That the flower thing is, I stole that from, uh, well, the family tree made sense. It was like, okay, I totally came in and was like, oh, this is great. This is a great idea, da, da, da. But then the flower thing was, I used to do, uh, I used to produce the Time Life CD collections a few years ago. Oh, and you okay. remember when you watch one of those silly commercials and it's going up and the song's like, what is that song? What is that song? Who's that group? And then all of a sudden it says, oh, in highlight, fifth dimension. You know, and, yes. and yes. that was my song. Was my, you know, right. that was it. Charlie's asking, was there ever any thought or attempt to get the other famous studio band from Motown, the Funk Brothers? Did they ever, was there ever any crossover no, with no, the 
they they ever play together? In those or? days, there was every you know, each city had its own thing going on. It's really it was not a, organized. If anything, the Funk Brothers were maybe a little more organized because they seemed to play at one studio right. more than uh, anything. But the Wrecking Crew, don't forget, it's maybe 18, 15 guys, ten guys, whatever it is. They're they're working with different producers all the time. It's not one wow. label. You yes. Know, so he's you know they're working with Lou Adler. They're working with Herb. They're working with Dave Axelrod. They're look, working with Jan, you know, and yeah. Phil. So mm -hmm. it was never that thing. The closest it came is when um, Jameson moved to L.A. And that's when they started working with him. Or Bob Babbitt did some stuff later. But those guys, you never, yeah. even in the '60s, they never um, ever left town. I Hal did, and Joe Osborne did when they did. I think the um, sessions with uh, Paul Simon, Simon Garfunkel. But mm -hmm. very seldom did they ever leave town. Wow. Yeah, no, it just it would have been a very interesting concert to have had, you know, the Funk Brothers and the Wrecking Crew all on one stage at the time. But un unlike the immediate family who are now out on tour, uh, we just saw them in Santa Clarita with, with Nick Marshall right. opening. And you know what was so nice? I've, I haven't seen Russell Kunkel in, oh, my gosh, since record one Valgare days in the 1980s when yeah. um, Nico Bolas, who's also in your film, was uh, engineering and mixing Building the Perfect Beast, Don Henley, which is when I met Cooch yeah. back in those days. Um, so, you know, they, the, the, whole, the whole thing is sort of all tied together so beautifully. But I didn't realize until watching the immediate family film last night that Danny Korchmar had written All She Wants to Do is Dance. Yeah. Never Danny, knew that. I mean, that's the other thing that these guys are very different than the Wrecking Crew guys. There's, the differences are these guys would go on the road. They're also, these guys were writers. Danny yeah. and Wadi wrote a lot of songs. Yeah. Um, they also, you know, the difference is also they spent time with these artists. When they're spending time with Linda right. and Carol and James, they're all the same age, in a sense. They're, it's not yeah. like when my father in 1960, he's 30 years old. He's an old guy. And he's working with the Beach Boys who are teenagers. Right. You know, yeah. So, so there's not that, brother, they're not, you know, they're not of the same, hey, let's hang out. And, right. you know, well, dad never, and so they, so they bond. So when Dan, Waddy's on the road with Linda, he's singing, you know, songs with her in you know, the off hours or the Everly brothers. He said he's, he would sing, he and, um, they would sing, basically be in the, uh, their hotel Why? room and the Everly brothers would slowly, one would come in and then the second one go, what are you guys doing? And they yeah. sing all right. yeah. wow. the love of music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and obviously the Wrecking Crew, there were a lot more of them, and they were not, not so much a road band, but the immediate family, I was so happy when they actually turned into a band, got themselves out of the studio and off the road with other people and have built with with Bruce Quarto and Quarto Valley Records. Yeah. It's also the home of our client, Edgar Winter. Um, and Sammy's, Sammy's watching from Atlanta. Hello, my darling. She runs mm -hmm. Edgar's social world. Um yeah, you know, I was so glad to see them. I'm like, I have to get tickets. I have to go see these guys. And then our, our act, Nick, got the opening slot. So we got we got to go and hang out. And what was so nice was because, you know, these these canyon clubs are great, but the, there was one at Santa Clarita. The stage is very, very small. And oh, there, so yeah. get two drum kits on there for the opener, John Ferraro's drums for Nick Marshall, and then yeah. Russell Kunkel's drums for the immediate family. So Ferraro said, I don't know how, because if Russell, they go in and they do their sound check at like two o'clock and then the opener gets a line check at like 5.30, yeah. 6 before the doors open. So I texted Nico Bolas, who gave me Russell Kunkel's number, and I texted Russell and said, you know, would you be so kind as to let uh, John Ferraro play your kit? And he's like, sure, no problem. Not sure if my stool's yeah. the right height. Maybe he wants, you know, bring his sticks and his own stool, but absolutely. Yeah. They have in each other for years but it's that sort no. of honor among thieves among right. drummers and he yeah. was just oh, no. the sweetest I, and same with herman matthews at, at another gig he's you know he's he, another huge drummer but ferraro was on the road with burt Backrack for 25 yeah. years so you know everybody yeah. knows him and he's not good but you know it's just so generous of russell yeah here's his you know sponsored dw drum kit and yeah. he's like yeah, sure. if, if, if ferraro doesn't mind sitting in front of my sponsorship you know skin yeah have it, have at it. It was so mm -hmm. sweet. So yeah. just save the hassle for the roadies too, you know. You know, I got to say the musicians, and I've always said this, um, musicians are an interesting group of people because they 
have to work with each other. They have to listen to each other. You know, they're uh, an artistic form like actors that have to work with other artists. It's not like you're a solo painter or, you know, and yeah. they, there was the, the greatest thing, like when they're making the wrecking crew was when, and you remember we were, we were struggling over those years. And then some, I would see someone with a, you know, they would see my shirt and say, Oh, I love that film. And we still haven't been out. I go, where'd you see it? Oh, saw it on the Perry Como bus. Okay. Uh, well, you see it, saw it on the uh, Elton John flight or the Gliss flight. And it's like, it got around, it was like bootlegged, and in, which was, oh. it used to piss me off, but then I realized musicians are the best because all they want to do is talk oh. about good shit. I got the latest yeah. bass, I got the latest guitar player. Oh my God, you should hear that guitar player. Oh my God, you should hear that drummer. Yeah. Yes, there are always jealousies, whatever, everybody's jealous, but they also love to brag about who that they other knew. person they saw. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and yeah, absolutely. Or who they got to play with. And that, I have to say, much more giving as uh, musicians than actors in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, I'm not dissing on actors. I just think there's yeah. something that, you know. Well, an, is, an actor, an different, actor yeah. can also really be, they hop from role to role and they have to work in an ensemble on every production, but they are their own brand, you know. And then, like, yeah, you're right. That's it. You're right. That's exactly true. true whatever and so a band is a, a band is a brotherhood or a sisterhood um until they until one of them goes solo but i think you know actors sort of stand alone as their i'm i'm the box office get i'm the tom cruise i'm going to sell the tickets yeah. whatever they work great on set and they're wonderful people but at the end of the day they still have to represent their brand and moving forward and making more money in the next thing mm -hmm. right yeah so and that, yeah and these guys at this point in their time when you got danny waddy and Leland and Russ and, you know, um, right. but they're way past that feeling of yeah. jealousy. They're way right. past, you know what yeah. I mean? And yeah. I can't say that they're the, there's, there's some of the nicest guys around. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, Collaboration cool. versus competition. Dina, that's, yeah, an, well, that's an interesting, yeah. listen, absolutely. There's always that competition because you're doing your best you can. Right. Yes. I mean, you know, well, it and Dina knows she's she was on our show a few weeks ago. She's just been inducted into the Sports Broadcasting Hall of Fame. She is a rare woman in uh, NFL camera yeah. history. She's, you know, she's she's been outside at Lambeau Field in the snow shooting NFL games for years. Yeah. And, you know, again, it's not about a competition of who gets the best camera angle or the best shot. They just want to come together as a crew and give the best broadcast to the fans at home. Right. So yeah. of mm -hmm. all people, Dina would understand yeah. understand that yeah. so where can people um when can people expect to see the wrecking crew what is your uh, current distribution you mean the media family well the uh, wrecking, the, wrecking, yeah no, 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 the media family sorry the wrecking, I know crew, let's see wrecking crew you can actually see on hulu i think right now yeah. and yes. uh in youtube and other places yeah. you need family we're at that stage of we've had we came out in woodstock was our opening festival i think in october and we've done like eight nine festivals now we've got four awards three audience awards and a and in boulder we uh, we just won uh, the mo the favorite music film uh right. best music film whatever right. now we're trying to get we really need people to sign up on the website so they could see the trailer and the outtakes um what it does is gives me analytics i need to start showing i want to show these people hey uh, these distributors out there we're not just a, a small you know that listen i had the same problem with wrecking crew you right. know and yeah. i'm not it's not like the first time here right but wrecking crew's uh seven years old in the sense right. that there's new people wrecking so crew has never stopped by the way i still go and people still talk to me they still every day I get an email from someone just seeing it for the first time right yeah. so with the immediate family i need to make noise Okay. So anybody, I don't care where you are, please just sign up on the Instagram or and share those posts with other people. Tell people these films. And I always tell if you see an indie film like this, Support you know, it. tell people about it. My yeah. other thing is, if you don't like it, don't tell anybody. But, but <laughs> I mean, but having not out yet. technically we're not out yet and we can't be, you know, obviously we're not to the shown it to the public unless you're in a festival. But we're right. also looking for sponsors. We're looking for, you know, um, 
uh, United, you know, we have a few sponsors that came on uh, the sessions, which is a beautiful organization with Jules Follett. Um, they became a main sponsor for us. So their logos on our credits. Right. Um, we're dedicating songs again. And it's right. not because we need the money for the license. We're paid. But what we want to do is continue this and take this to different cities and try to make the most of it and have a, 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 a what do you call it, a charity event yeah. where we can help the charity as well as help the film get out there. Yeah. Right. You know, I'm not going to ever stop. No. Uh, this film will go on forever. And I will, until I uh, get it out there, I'm not going to stop trying to get it out there. It'll, it'll be out probably in the next few months. But right. we really need uh, people to start talking about it more. So the website is immediatefamilyfilm.com. Yeah. Please go there, grab it, share it, do all, send all your love. We're obviously yeah. going to post this on our YouTube channel. And uh, Danielle, I'll send you the link to this interview so that you can share it with your world as well. Yeah. Um, and go on Facebook and Instagram at Immediate Family Film. Go give them a follow and, uh, you know, see, share, get get the little repost app and share away. And so what, what's I'm next? Learning. What's That's next? Doing, um, two, two projects. Uh, one I have going is, which is really fun, is uh, we just started it, is um, Wolfman Jack. Oh. Wolfman Jack documentary. Wow. And that is one of my favorites. And... Yeah. I hear a bunch of dogs in the background. What's going on? Uh -oh. Let's see. Uh -oh. Hold on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh cute. Yeah, so, right, so the, uh, let me just show you that. Uh, the dog in the background is my neighbor's dog. I guess I'm taking care of right now. <laughs> just came in. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so, you know where's home by the name? Oh, wait, hold on. Come here. Let me introduce you. Come, that's, hello. Oh, that's Ringo. Sweet pie. So oh, Ringo. Ringo. Is he left-handed? Yes. The reason Ringo is, and this is Rosie. Ringo lives next door. Ringo is Chris Jago, who's a fabulous drummer from Liverpool. Oh, and funny. when they got the dog, they, the dog's name was Ringo. They said, that's the dog. That's so the dog. Chris, yeah. Chris Jago got Ringo. That's so funny. I'm so Wolfman Jack is up, up next. Yeah, Wolfman okay. Jack is, is doing that. And we had the blessing of the family. And we go talk to the Todd, the son. And, and we started that. And I have this other thing called Hanging with Dr. Z. I don't know if anybody knows that. Hanging with, oh, there you go. Hanging with Dr. Z is, is Dana Gould, who's a uh, comedian. He was a he wrote uh -huh. on The Simpsons and producer and fabulous comedian. He was a great. And he, um, okay, I was just looking at all these notes coming across. Um, I love to, Dina. Um, I'll hook you up. So basically, Dana Gould is, plays Dr. Zayas of uh, The Planet of the Apes. And we do, it's uh -huh. like Fernwood Tonight meets Dick Cavett. Uh -huh. And we bring in these comedians and we did this during COVID because we couldn't do anything. So we right. had COVID, we had them, the comedians on the other side of the stage in another room and we would connect Dana and da, 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 da. And they would just riff improv all the way through. So it's hanging wow. with Dr. Z .com. Okay. Um, It is That's the funniest group of people. There's no money involved. I don't make any money, which I'm okay with because I love this job. We're just That's doing it for fun. And um, it's been fun. Yeah, it's absolutely great. Well, thank you so much for spending the time yes. um, with us today because I know, I know how busy you are and it's great to hook up after however many years it is, probably 15 or 20 years since we saw you over in the marina yeah. at a charity do. And, um, you know, you and I will talk offline. I'll, Angie will yeah. hook you up with Dina Sheldon and Jeff Zachary, her partner, who is also a brilliant okay. uh, camera person. And they've, they've invented all kinds of, Robo cams and boat cams and things that you might even be interested in. Absolutely. In using. Hmm. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm, all right. So I'm coming out to see you guys next week. Whatever I'm doing, we're just going, I'm taking you ladies out. Okay. Right. Let's go. Ladies, how very dare you? <laughs> <laughs> who, who are you calling a lady? I am no lady. How very dare you. Very I, dare you. I resemble that remark. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, so, now. As our special as our special guests, uh, as our as our viewers will know, for our very special guests, um, we always write finish with a limerick in your honor. So, oh no, uh, so, oh, yeah. no. here so, it is. Standing by a one, two, two three. This, this guy's guy such a talented, talented lad. lad. No, no doubt he takes after his dad. dad. His skills are so many. No, no flies on our Denny. Denny. His, his movies, movies are really not bad. Da da. Wow. See you on the other I side. Love that. 
<laughs> that is <laughs> a so much for joining us today. And, and you know uh, what's everyone... great? You didn't use artificial intelligence. No, we didn't. No, no, nope. we did nope. not use you Chat GPT didn't. to write that. Nope. Although we, I am actually training Chat GPT to write limericks. Oh, nice. Oh, that's a, that's another story. That's my next book. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just writing a limerick book, so you yeah. never know. <laughs> well, thanks very much, kids. Everybody thanks, needs me. to go to immediatefamilyfilm.com, sign up, make a noise, spread the love, tell the world, and we'll see you all of a sudden next Tuesday. Okay. Thanks, Teddy. God bless. Bye-bye.